Good afternoon, and welcome to HHS's celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We are delighted to welcome all of you from across the nation today. I am Julie Hawker, the Commissioner of the Administration on Disabilities at the Administration for Community Living, and I will be your MC today. In just a few moments, we'll hear from Roger Severino, the Director of the Office of Civil Rights here at HHS. After Roger, we will have a panel discussion with leaders from across our department. Together, we will reflect on our progress in the years since the passage of the ADA, and we will examine all that HHS is doing to truly achieve the promises of the ADA. Finally, ACL Administrator and my boss, Lance Robertson, will conclude our event. But first, we are honored to be joined today by a very special guest. Alex Azar was sworn in as President Trump's Secretary of Health and Human Services in January 2018. His current tenure at HHS is a second tour of duty at the department after serving as General Counsel and then Deputy Secretary in the 2000s. He has spent his career working in senior healthcare leadership roles in both the public and private sectors. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the 24th United States Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar. Well, Julie, uh, thank you for that introduction. And uh, we're just so, so delighted that uh, Julie is our commissioner. Uh, she's done just incredible work and uh, has been such a great partner to work with. And uh, hello, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to join this celebration of the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. On July 26th, 1990, our country took an important step forward in affirming the dignity and the rights of people with disabilities when President George H.W. Bush signed the ADA into law. Today, an entire generation of people with disabilities has grown up with the protections, rights, and higher expectations offered by the ADA. And our nation's stronger because more people have the opportunity to fully participate and to contribute. Thanks in part to advances in healthcare and improvements in accessibility, people with disabilities also enjoy greater life expectancy than ever before. But people with disabilities still face disparities in receiving preventive healthcare, have more difficulty finding doctors and securing appointments, and have greater general unmet needs. Prejudices about quality of life continue to threaten the lives of people with disabilities when life-saving care is needed. And too many people with disabilities who want to live in the community and could do so are needlessly institutionalized. Tackling these serious challenges is a priority for the Trump administration and for our department. We're committed to upholding the rights of Americans with disabilities. That includes equitable access to both routine and life-saving care and the right to receive services in the most integrated settings. It also includes advancing the principles of integration and inclusion across the lifespan. I'm gonna mention just a few examples of recent work in which our department can take particular pride. Last September, the Administration for Community Living launched the Center for Human Dignity and Healthcare for Individuals with Disabilities with the goal of reducing life-limiting healthcare inequities faced by people with disabilities. Over the last few years, several cases involving the denial of care based on disability have been resolved by our Office for Civil Rights. In one case last year, for instance, an individual with an intellectual disability was deemed ineligible for a heart transplant solely because of that disability. Because of Roger Severino and OCR's actions here, that person's eligibility status was corrected and the hospital system revised its eligibility criteria to prevent such illegal discrimination from occurring in the future. In, in our nation's response to COVID-19, we also acted swiftly to ensure that no individual was denied care or put at the bottom of the list when seeking testing or care. The CARES Act also included an unprecedented $85 million in direct funding to 352 centers for independent living across the country. With this funding, CILs, which are community-based organizations operated by people with disabilities, were able to address some of the most critical needs 
of people with disabilities. <clears throat> that included food, personal care, and basic home items, housing assistance, transportation for medical appointments, and PPE such as masks and gloves to ensure con continuity of support services. Long before COVID-19, we've been working to ensure that people with disabilities have access to the services and supports that are critical to living and fully participating in the community and to ensure that those services and supports are high quality. We've also worked to protect the rights of Americans with disabilities in human services, including their rights to be parents. Through efforts at places like NIH and CDC, we're working to improve the representation of people with disabilities in research and to collect more and better data about people with disabilities, particularly intellectual and developmental disabilities. At NIH and ACL, we're investing in research and in translating that research into interventions to create more opportunities for people with all types of disabilities. Those are just a few of the many examples that reflect our commitment to honoring the innate dignity of every single person from the moment of conception through natural death. Throughout today's event, you'll hear more about those examples and other ways that HHS is working to achieve the promise of the ADA. In concluding, I wanna note that much of the work I've described is only possible because of the hard work of advocates for disability rights, many of whom live with disabilities themselves. They're the reason the ADA was written and signed and they paved its way with earlier legislation and hard won battles for inclusion. Many advocates continue to partner with us to make sure that our programs and services truly meet the needs of the people they're intended to serve, and we're grateful for their work. Following this event, I hope you'll take a few minutes to explore our ADA anniversary website to learn about its history, how it and the disability rights movement have changed our country, and most importantly, the impact it has had on the lives of people with disabilities. Thanks for joining us for this important celebration. And I hope today's discussion prompts all of us to rededicate ourselves to the important causes of equality and inclusion for peoples with disabilities. Thank you very much, Julie. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. This is Roger Severino. I'm the director of the Office for Civil Rights at HHS. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your leadership on this issue. Uh, you have supported us every step of the way in terms of programmatic and enforcement side. So really, we commend you for your efforts and your support for the ADA and for disability rights generally. Today marks a poignant day in the civil rights community. Today, they are burying an icon of the civil rights movement, and that is John Lewis. Congressman Lewis was a freedom writer, and I was struck by one of the images where he was denied access to a bus and because of his race. Uh, and because of his efforts, he paved the way for the civil rights law, laws during the civil rights movement, and then particularly was the lodestar for the methods and the approach for making sure that nobody was excluded in public transportation, um, in places of public accommodation, in restaurants, in hotels. And that same movement carried us through, through to the ADA, including persons with disabilities ensure they weren't excluded from buses, from restaurants and hotels, from medical facilities, from human services. So we're actually building on the legacy of these giants of the civil rights movement to make sure that the fundamental dignity of everybody is respected. So we look back and celebrate all the work that has been accomplished, the pioneering efforts of the civil rights movement to expand the sphere of people who are not left behind uh, especially in this time of crisis, we're looking out for the most vulnerable to make sure there is space for everybody. So this this is 30 years of reflection. Um, I'm so glad that Lance and Julie helped put this event together. We have a, a great panel to walk us through the history and what we expect going forward. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julie Hawker to kick us off on the panel. Great. Thank you, Roger. And now we do. We turn to that panel discussion. And it's an honor today for me to be a part of our celebration. As some of you know, yes, 
Hi, everybody. Sorry, technical difficulties. Uh, Julie dropped off. Um, internet connection uh, challenges, but she'll jump back on. Where she was at, though, was obviously introducing the panel. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and proceed and um, uh, I'm excited to um, introduce you to the panelists. All of these folks are just fabulous, um, committed leaders within the department, and um, they all, in many great ways, uh, carry forward the uh, tenants of the ADA. And um, again, it's an honor to work with them. So I want to start off and introduce um, uh, Lynn Johnson. Lynn Johnson is the Assistant Secretary at HHS's Administration for Children and Families. And um, since her Senate confirmation in August of 2018, she has just been churning and burning. Um, before joining HHS, Lynn served as uh, the Executive Director of Jefferson County Human Services in Colorado. Uh, she also has her own consulting firm and served as Chief of Staff to the Colorado Lieutenant Governor Jane Norton and policy advisor to Colorado Governor Bill Owens, and uh, was a probation and parole officer in the United States courts. So uh, there's Lynn, and now Julie's back. So Julie, I just introduced Lynn, so now you can take over from here. All right, well, thank you. It wouldn't be a virtual event uh, in 2020 if we didn't have some technical issues. So thanks a lot, Lance. And Lynn, my apologies uh, for missing your introduction, uh, but we'll keep rolling on along here. And I will, uh, Lance, I think that you probably introduced yourself, but in case folks don't know, you have led ACL um, as the administrator since August of 2017 when you were confirmed by the Senate. The a ACL was created around the fundamental principle that all people, regardless of age or disability, should be able to live and fully participate in the community. Prior to joining ACL, Lance served as Oklahoma's Director of Aging Services, where he also managed the state's Medicaid waiver program. His career also includes more than a decade at Oklahoma State University, and he is a proud Army veteran. Rear Admiral Michael Wiaki is an enrolled member of the Zuni tribe and the director of the Indian Health Service. He administers a nationwide health care delivery program that is responsible for providing preventative, curative, and community health to approximately 2.6 million American Indians and Alaska Natives in hospitals, clinics, and other settings throughout the United States. He previously served as the Chief Executive Officer for the Phoenix Indian Medical Center and is a veteran of the United States Air Force. Holder Lynch has served as the Deputy Administrator and Director of the Centers for Medicaid and SHIP Services since May 2019. He joined CMS in May of 2017 as Senior Counselor to the Administrator. Prior to joining HHS, Holder served as the State Medicaid Director for Nebraska and as Chief of Staff to the Secretary of the Louisiana Department of Health and Human Services. And Roger. Roger Severino, as you know, is the Director of the Office of Civil Rights. Before joining the department in 2017, he served as Director of the DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society at the Heritage Foundation. Earlier roles included seven euros as a trial attorney in the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. He also served as Chief Operation Officer and Legal Counsel for the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. I want to thank all of our panelists today for joining us. And let's get started. Lynn, I'm going to start with you, if that's OK. Um, we heard from the Secretary, and I think many people know that we have looked across the lifespan at all of the barriers and opportunities for Americans with disabilities today. And one thing you and I have worked on together and, and really examined quite a bit over the last couple of years is the true need to better integrate and coordinate systems that support children with disabilities. And that includes supporting the families that they're a part of. Can you tell us a little bit about what ACF is doing in this space? Thank you, Julie, and this is a fantastic opportunity to talk to you all and to celebrate the 30 years of the ADA. What an honor. The Administration for Children and Families has revisited and looked at how we serve all people, and that includes people that have disabilities, that includes in individuals in low income, individuals who have been struggling in any way, any way. And we said primary prevention is the priority 
primary prevention means up front, we wrap around a family, whether their child has a disability or the parents have disabilities. And we help strengthen that family so the children aren't removed and put into a government system. If you think about the amount of money we spend paying for foster care, if we spent half of that in wrapping around families so that they can be successful with their children, then we could have a much healthier, thriving community. And that's what we're doing at ACF, is making primary prevention the priority in every single thing we do. Thanks, Lynn. And, you know, I want to stay on the point that you made about parents, um, because parents who have disabilities have also continued to face discrimination in the United States. And I know that you've worked with Roger and his team on this issue very closely. Roger, can you tell us a little bit about what the Office of Civil Rights is doing to ensure that parents with disabilities have their rights upheld in the United States? And Roger, you might be on mute. It goes back to the same thing that animated the ADA itself. President H.W. Bush said it was time for the shameful walls of exclusion to come tumbling down. And that really has a, a big impact when it comes to adoption of foster care. There was an exclusion, bias against parents being foster parents because of stereotypes about disabilities. So we had actually two settlements uh, one with the state of Oregon, where we had parents that had intellectual disabilities. In fact, they were actually given IQ tests, and those test scores were used against them. A very blunt instrument that was used to not only deny them custody of potential adoption, adoption um, or foster care, this was about their own children being taken away from them. Their own children. Uh, is a, a sad state of affairs, and love overcomes a whole multitude of deficits. We entered into a voluntary resolution agreement with the state of Oregon after we did a, a investigation, um, and they have actually cleaned up their process to not to make sure that that such blunt instruments wouldn't be misused in the future. Additionally, we have the story of Joan Pachulis. She was a woman in Georgia who was actually denied the ability to be a foster parent uh, because she had fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. And again, this was stereotyping, where it was used against her to say she was not fit. They didn't even do an individualized assessment to make sure that she had the ability to take care of her children that she would be uh, the foster parent for. Again, this is stereotyping, a blunt instrument. In that case, she actually had to go to a private provider to get a placement of a child, and she was actually given placement of a child, which, of course, proves that she was, of course, fit to begin with, and she's a wonderful parent now. We have a video of her story uh, as part of this ADA celebration event on the HHS website. We have it linked as well as to the Office for Civil Rights, hhs.gov slash OCR. My office enforces Section 504 of the Rehab Act and the ADA and Section 1557. So those are authorities that we have used that applies to health and human services, including adoption and foster care. Thanks, Roger, and thank you for that work. It's, it's a joy to work alongside of you. And Lynn, I know that um, this is a space where, again, ACF is also uh, really leading in a new way. You recently launched a new uh, foster care initiative, and I know that um, one in three children in foster care almost has a disability. And you and I have uh, partnered on that specific issue. Can you tell us a little bit about this new initiative out of ACF uh, over the last few months? Absolutely, Julian, and you're right. We have just initiated the all-in foster adoption challenge that the President Trump so wisely signed an executive order to strengthen our child welfare system, which includes this all-in challenge. While we are working to fix and change and, and do better in our child welfare system, we also know, as you just pointed out, that about 33% of the kids that sit in our foster care system have a disability. We are working to get everybody to be all in. We have 50 governors, all of our county child welfare managers, state managers, um, politicians, faith-based groups, nonprofits are all saying these children deserve permanency. So no matter what the challenge, no matter what the barrier, Roger said it well, love will get us to where we need to go. And every one of these kids deserves a permanent home and a loving forever family. 
and were looking at, were they removed from their families because of their disabilities? And if so, can we remove, return them to loving parents and wrap around services so that a parent does not have to give up parental rights to get the help that they need? So every child, 125,000 children that are currently waiting today, and as you said it, about 33% having disabilities, will have a loving forever home by the time we're finished with this challenge. And with Roger's help, your help, Lance's help, everybody's help, we will do this and get it done well. Everybody deserves that love that Roger mentioned. Absolutely. And you know, Lynn, one thing that we talk about is um, how important childhood is and setting um, all of us up for healthy and productive uh, adulthoods. And I wanna switch a little bit because Admiral Wiaki, when you and I have chatted, uh, we talked a little bit as well about the important role that early intervention plays um, in some of the communities and, and tribes that you work with so closely. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've been working to strengthen childhood interventions for children with disabilities? Uh, thank you, Julie. And at the Indian Health Service, our mission is to raise the physical, mental, social, and spiritual health of American Indians and Alaska Natives to the highest level. And I take our responsibilities to the communities that we serve very seriously. American Indian and Alaska Native people have long experienced lower health status when compared to other Americans. Uh, lower life expectancy and the disproportionate disease burden exist, exists perhaps because of inadequate educational opportunities and disproportionate poverty and cultural differences. And these are broad quality of life issues rooted in economic adversity and poor social conditions. There are also a number of challenges that we face in delivering healthcare, especially at facilities that are located in some of the most rural and remote parts of our country like in the Supai village at the bottom of the Grand Canyon or up in Barrow, Alaska in the Arctic Circle. Our goal is to ensure that comprehensive, culturally acceptable personal and public health services are available and accessible to all American Indian and Alaska Native people. And at IHS, this, this includes addressing geographic and scheduling barriers uh, to getting American Indian and Alaska Native children to see a de developmental pediatrician for a de definitive diagnosis. In-person medical appointments can present unique challenges for people with disabilities, particularly if they live far away from their providers or in areas without accessible public transport. We've made great progress in addressing some of these challenges by using innovative tools, such as our Telebehavior Health Center of Excellence to reach our patients who are most in need. We also provide education, training, consultation, and resources for clinicians treating American Indian and Alaska Native youth diagnosed with neurodevelopmental disorders through our Indian Health Service Indian Children's Program. So supporting families with access to quality health care, screenings, and interventions continues to be a priority for the Indian Health Service. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Admiral. And I think, you know, you hit on two points that I sort of want to follow up, maybe with Calder, um, if that's okay. You talked a bit about innovation, and I want to pair that idea a little bit with something the secretary hit on uh, that, that we talk a lot about, and that is about uh, protecting the rights like, across the lifespan um, from the very moment life begins until it ends. Holder, I know uh, for you, you've been focusing a lot on strengthening home and community-based services and supports for people with disabilities of all ages. And I'd love to hear and, and have you share with our audience today a little bit more about the great progress that we're making. Absolutely, thank you, Julie. And thanks for, uh, for having me be part of this wonderful event celebrating the 30 years uh, of tremendous progress we've made as a nation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, at CMS, in more particular within the division uh, that I'm responsible for, which is the Center for Medicaid and SHIP Services, we remain just as committed as we were 30 years ago to safeguarding every beneficiary's right to receive the highest quality care uh, in the setting of their choice in the most integrated setting possible. And as you know, and as you know, Medicaid is such an important program for millions of families across the country, serving almost 72 million Americans, many of whom are children, um, and many of whom are individuals with disabilities. Um, and many of whom uh, face unique challenges in their day-to-day -day lives. And the program plays such an important role in helping them achieve their fullest life possible. Uh, Medicaid itself plays such a huge part, as you know, in 
the home and community-based services infrastructure in our country, uh, whether that's through the HCBS waiver programs that states administer in partnership with CMS, the other authorities that they provide community-based services and interventions, or the Money Follows the Person program, which has made tremendous progress in helping individuals leave institutional settings and thrive in community-based care, uh, which is where they want to be. And more, and also, uh, well, most importantly, it's where folks want to be. It's higher quality, delivers the right outcome. And it's also good for taxpayers because it's more cost-effective to serve individuals. So it's a, it's a true win-win. You know, at CMS, we've really been focusing on moving that needle forward and thinking about how do we, and how we do that is, is really found, is, is the foundation is measurement. We've got to be able to understand the performance of our system. So we've been working to develop a home and community-based services quality framework, a more complete strategy and work plan to align and coordinate activities both within CMS and with our other partners, of course, um, many of whom are represented today on this, uh, on this meeting, uh, to, to improve the way we measure quality in HCBS and ensure the health and safety of people receiving those services. And that's really one part of a broader effort in the agency uh, to, uh, to hold ourselves and states who administer the program in partnership with us accountable through efforts like our Medicaid and CHIP scorecard, improvements in federal data collection, and really raising the bar and expectation around evaluating the outcomes of the care that we're delivering for beneficiaries so that we can actually say that the inter that the investments we're making are delivering results on behalf of American families, including those, uh, those living with disabilities. If I could jump in, <clears throat> Connor made a great point, and I commend CMS for their efforts of highlighting the issue of integration under Olmstead, making sure it's a least restrictive setting and especially during COVID-19, where there's a whole lot of uh, things in flux as to where people are going to be placed more vulnerable, one key point remains, our civil rights laws have not been suspended, and that includes the Olmstead mandate, and we want to be uh, aware of that, and we hope, at least from OCR's perspective, to issue some additional guidance on that soon. Absolutely, and I have to say, um, you know, in my role, it's just been... Um, so rewarding to work closely with CMS and Roger with OCR um, on this issue of true inclusion in the community. I know, Lance, that's something that you and I work on every single day at ACL. It's, it's in our name and it's at the core of our mission. One thing that we've talked a lot uh, to all of the states about and we've really been working hard on during uh, the response to COVID-19 um, is the uh, the fact that many people with disabilities are far more likely to have serious um, symptoms related to COVID-19. And uh, this has been something that you and I have been tackling since uh, the onset of this pandemic. Lance, can you talk a little bit today about um, what we've seen and, and been able to do in our partnerships to address um, some of those, uh, those serious concerns among uh, people with disabilities? Yeah, absolutely, Julie. And of course, that disproportionality uh, certainly rests with um, with the individuals, as you mentioned, but also, you know, expands really and also impacts, of course, the direct care workforce, whether or not they have access to individuals they're traditionally used to having help them, um, also access to PPE, and then certainly uh, what services now have been either frozen, eliminated, or in some way modified. And all of that, of course, impacts the health and well-being of people with disabilities. Um, again, compounding their quarantine situation. Of course, like you said, um, at ACL, our commitment remains to help support people um, in every way they need to remain in the community. And even during COVID, of course, as you had just uh, referenced a number of concerns that we continue to address, things like transportation, food insecurity, uh, making sure that people have the right access to service information that is timely and relevant. And of course, we're able to accomplish that through a number of um, key things that, that I believe uh, we ought to be very proud of. And, you know, we at ACL uh, fund the ADA Resource Center. So that's a great resource for people in every community if they need some information in that uh, direct respect, because we all want to work towards preventing an eventual problem or a challenge. Um, and then, of course, we also fund the assistive technology program. So much of what we do in that space has helped people even during quarantine times remain very functional with limited services. The biggest thing, though, and the secretary referenced this, obviously, is our work around health equity. And again, so proud to partner with Roger and, and others who are helping on that enforcement end to make sure um, that, you know, folks with disabilities are certainly treated as equitably as they um, deserve. And some of the examples that the secretary highlighted, you know, things that uh, should not be taking place, such as, you know, ventilator, ventilator um, 
um, ventilator uh, rationing, and then organ transplant decisions that are unfavorable, um, hospital visitation rights that are restricted, and then of course the issue around children, both fostering and then raising children. So all of that health equity work also I think has been um, a paramount part of our response and that's gonna continue to be our focus. Great, absolutely, Lance. And, and Calder, I know that you know during COVID-19, uh, one thing uh, that CMS and ACL ha have been working on is the increased risk in congregate settings. Um, it's really illustrated, that risk has really illustrated for us the need to accelerate rebalancing efforts. What does that mean for CMCS? Um, it, it's a huge issue for us and for our state partners. I think, as you said, we have all recognized for a long time, you know, that we have to do more to help individuals live in their own homes and communities for, you know, as long as possible. Uh, but COVID-19 has underscored the additional risks that come with living in congregate and institutional settings. And I think for many states are accelerating the urgency of moving forward and rebalancing efforts. So they've come to us seeking support, resources, guidance on, on how to make progress. Many states have made wonderful progress, but there's still, there's still a lot of, uh, a lot of room for improvement there. So we are, um, we are prioritizing that work. We're engaging with states to provide them with technical assistance and support around how to fully leverage many of the existing federal authorities and opportunities, whether that's under Money Follows the Person or under some of the 1915 C and I authorities that can expand access to community-based care. Um, but I think there's also uh, the administrator, Administrator Verma, has really challenged our team to think boldly and to come up with new strategies to help really accelerate those efforts. So we've recently, uh, and, and part partnership with many of you have been conducting listening sessions with advocates and, and individuals uh, with disabilities as well as states and providers and other researchers to think about and brainstorm ways that CMS can help support those efforts. So you'll see more work from us coming ahead as we work to put out new tools, new guidance, new opportunities um, that really help seize um, you know, this opportunity while it may be born of terrible circumstances. We, should, we, should, we, we must use it to make sure that we're making progress um, and, and expand access to uh, community-based services and right-sizing the, the footprint of institutional care. Uh, for us, even though it means that maybe some of the operational day-to-day -day work of coming into compliance with the settings rule had to be paused for states just because of the realities of, uh, of stay-at-home orders and the impacts of that, it's no, by, by no means recognized as any uh, decrease in commitment on behalf of CMS to continue pushing forward uh, with making sure that every setting that we have dollars flowing towards community-based care represents truly integrated uh, care settings for individuals that help them live uh, in the community and help them live the fullest life possible. So we're continuing to be committed to that and we, we're excited about the opportunities ahead. And Roger, I, I want to um, hit on something real briefly with you um, before we, th there were two good points, uh, lots of good points from Calder, I should say, but two I want to grab on and, and one um, is the visitation policies and crisis of care policies and I want to um, have you touch on that real quick and then, and then I'm going to toss it uh, back to some of our other panelists because the other thing Calder mentioned that I want to come back to is the way that we've quickly innovated and continued to think differently throughout this pandemic. And so I'm gonna put the Admiral and Lynn both on uh, a notice that I'm coming for them, uh, but I wanna make sure that we touch on the crisis of care standards because I know that's something, Roger, you've been championing. Yes, and the, during this time of crisis, our nation is tested like never before. How are we gonna treat the most vulnerable among us? And when it comes to crisis standards of care, what we're talking about is triaging. And the question was, who literally would get to live or die when it came to ventilator allocation? And we received several complaints with respect to plans from, other, from some states, including one that said a person with, quote unquote, profound mental retardation would be flatly ineligible to receive a ventilator. And just think about that for a moment. The message that sends that when resources get tight and the going gets tough, who gets thrown overboard? So we intervened and reached a voluntary resolution through our early case resolution process and that state in question changed their plans very quickly. There are four other states that we've been working with. Uh, there have been Alabama, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Connecticut, and we just reached a resolution with the state of Utah and their crisis standards of care. And what we've seen is a lot of these plans did not make individualized assessments using the best medical evidence. They would use these blood cap uh, cutoffs based on specific disabilities 
and open up the door for a quality of life judgment where a doctor or a triage, triage officer would be in this position of saying, you are more worthy of life than you are based on impermissible criteria. So we've been very pleased by the response from the states that in terms of their changes to their standards um, to make sure that it's based on individualized assessments that we don't have this discrimination come in and Utah we see as the best model so far. So hopefully we'll be hearing more about that. But most, most fundamentally, when it matters most, our laws are still in effect and we wanna make sure that the people who are most at risk get the most protection and are not forgotten or left behind. That's what the ADA was all about. Absolutely, it is at the heart of everything. And uh, you know, ACL and our entire network of grantees have been uh, so grateful to come alongside and, and raise those issues so quickly um, so we can get them resolved. And, and so I wanna thank everyone too who's listening today, who's worked hard in all of those states to, to work with your office to resolve those issues. And you know, staying on the pandemic and our quick pivot at HHS over the last several months, Admiral Wiaki, one thing uh, that you I know have um, been working on is increasing access to, to remote services, uh, making sure that people uh, with disabilities, particularly in those furthest to reach, most remote areas, um, also have access to care. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about um, how, uh, you know, the progress of that work and, and what's ahead? Yeah, thank you, Julie. Uh, well, definitely, as, as noted earlier, uh, we provide services in some of the most rural remote locations in our, in our country. Uh, I talked a little bit about telebehavioral health, but another program that we're really excited about is our community health aid program or our CHAP program. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary system of mid-level behavioral health, community health, and dental health professionals who will be working alongside the licensed providers to offer patients increased access to quality care. Uh, CHAP's a proven model that's been in operation up in Alaska for over 50 years. And just last month, we announced the national expansion of the CHAP program to the lower 48. This program provides education and training of tribal community health providers to increase access to care, uh, provide health promotion, disease prevention services. And it not only recognizes the need to provide culturally attuned care, but it expands the system of care for patients across tribal communities, ensuring that those that are living in rural and remote communities can receive routine direct patient care, regardless of ability. Uh, CHAP providers are unique in that they can be mobilized to provide direct patient care and meet patients where they are. Uh, traditionally, you know, patients are brought to a healthcare facility and the CHAP program illustrates that healthcare can be delivered to the patient in their home environment. So we're, we're really excited about this and uh, glad to see, as Calder mentioned, that uh, we have many partners across our HHS family uh, supporting this uh, mobilization and rollout as well. So thank you. Absolutely. And uh, I know that, that we continue to address telehealth and telemedicine uh, needs for people with disabilities and in rural communities all across our nation. Um, and so we look forward to continuing to see that access only increase. And then another place where we're really uh, still, uh, you know, in the trenches, finding solutions and thinking innovatively um, is with Head Start. Again, with our early intervention and um, children with disabilities are, are certainly among those in our Head Start program. And we want to make sure that COVID-19 doesn't uh, stop them from receiving the services and education uh, that they need and they have the right to. Can you tell us just briefly a little bit about what ACF is doing uh, as part of getting ready for the fall? Absolutely. And one of the things I think is critical to note about the Administration for Children and Families is that our work every day is with people who have challenges or barriers or are in crisis. So when COVID hit, we didn't have to start and say, what do we do with people who are challenged? What we did was how do we more enhance their lives and their quality of lives during a crisis and help those additional individuals who have moved under our care. So as we did that, we issued over 80 different guidances, hundreds of flexibilities, millions and millions of dollars. And Head Start was one of those programs that received funding. 
Head Start started summer camps and summer programs when oftentimes they're not open in the summer. And we have been getting, receiving different letters and information from sites, from families, from parents, from the kids who are getting services during the summer so that they will be ready to go to public school. And we're talking about children who couldn't even count to one who are now saying because of summer COVID camps, we're absolutely counting to 20. We're ready for kindergarten and Head Start is ready for them. So we are we have not stopped anything that we've been doing, but we're doing it differently. Some's virtual, some is with small groups of five, some is getting kids ready to come back to the classroom, but following all of CDC guidance. But remembering that Head Start is a program that was started to eliminate poverty. And that program serves both the adults and the children and again, meets our primary mission of prevention so that when those children go into K-12, the family is ready to advocate for their children and the children do extremely well. And that's what we're pushing forward. And based on what we're hearing about the data from this summer, families are doing well because we stayed open and just did things differently, more innovative, and we just continue to work with those children. Well, I've heard quite a bit today about innovation, uh, continuing to think differently, um, not giving up, um, in working every day to not only ensure the rights of people with disabilities, but to ensure that those rights are upheld. Um, we certainly, I think together as a panel, have been able to see how far we've come in the last 30 years, which is just tremendous to think about. Um, but. I want to uh, kind of wrap up our time as a panel uh, with one final lightning round. Um, and here, here's what I've been thinking about. Um, you know, in 30 years, we've made this tremendous progress. And we have leaders all across the department continuing to push the envelope and continuing to um, ensure the rights of Americans with disabilities. But suppose we all come back together in 30 years from now. So we're together in 2050, maybe we'll be in person. I'd love to hear from each of you where you think, uh, what, what is one achievement that we will be celebrating uh, as a result of the ADA? And uh, I am going to go in no particular order here, but Holder, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Julie. Um, you know, it's a, it, it, I, I hope as I look forward into the future that we have continued to build on the foundations that we've built, but we have accelerated our progress by fully unleashing the potential of using evidence and data to make uh, you know, the, the, the care and the interventions that we're able to offer through programs like Medicaid really more targeted to the needs of individuals. You know, person-centered care planning is obviously such an important principle in our programs, but we have done so in some ways blindly based on uh, not, not having available really data and information about the outcomes and performance of our program. We are beginning to, to see that with now having all states reporting much more complete data sets into CMS that can be leveraged, I think, to, to inform future policy decisions about what we pay for when we intervene that will allow us to go further upstream and help keep individuals in the community for longer, help design services and, and supports that are hyper personal to their uh, unique needs and that we know based on the evidence are going to uh, pay dividends for them uh, and for our nation over time. And so I, I really hope that we fully unleash that, that opportunity in the future. Well, I can't... Uh... Here, I, I can't li listen to you and hear you talk about fully community integration uh, without pivoting right to my boss, Lance Robertson. Oh, very nice. Thank you, Julie. I, I think for me, it's going to involve building on all of our efforts around employment. Um, we all know that uh, really at the end of the day, we need to do all that we can to support individuals with disabilities who would like to work. Uh, that's so liberating and, and so fulfilling in, in many, many countless ways. So, you know, here at ACL, we lead a multi-agency task force that focuses on increasing employment for people with disabilities. We're talking about, you know, conversations across uh, Department of Labor and um, Small Business Administration, uh, transportation. I could go on and on. And, and all of us are committed, I think, as federal partners in removing barriers and really addressing quite boldly what we can do to support uh, individuals with disabilities who, again, want to enter the workforce or now, in the case of the pandemic, re-enter 
the workforce and what we can do to make sure that those supports exist. And I think ultimately at the end of the day, fast forwarding 30 years, if we can continue to make great strides around employment, that's gonna make a huge difference. Great. Well, I don't think you would ever hear an argument on that one from me, Lance. Uh, I think it's a tremendous opportunity we have to improve uh, and increase the opportunities around employment. And Lynn, I know that ACF, um, at the heart of your mission, um, I know this from having worked there and working with you as well, that um, it's economic mobility and freedom. Uh, can, you, uh, can you go next? Where do you think we're going to be and, and what do you think we're going to be celebrating 30 years from now? And, and Julie, I'm going to rope a few things together, but it's um, one, um, nothing against Roger Severino, but to put him out of business. It is that children will not be removed from parents just because they have a disability or a parent won't have to lose their child because they cannot get the help they need because the child has a disability. And that rolls into the public and private education systems will provide those support services, not at the bare minimum, but they would exceed all expectations so that children can thrive and ultimately move right into that employment successfully. And all of that would be in a smooth way working with each and every person that's on this panel. Great. Well, Roger, before we put you out of business, um, since you won't be joining us in 30 years, um, where do you see us celebrating in 30 years? I think hopefully it'll be a cultural change. The ADA was about the fundamental inherent dignity of every human being, regardless of their ability. That's the vision. And that's what I want to see fully implemented. However, there's still this stigma of exclusion. We have a utilitarian philosophy that measures people by how much they could quote unquote contribute, um, how valuable they are, or whether or not they are a burden to society or they're expensive or inconvenient. Uh, we see this and look what happens in Iceland. They solved their problem of children with Down syndrome by eliminating children with Down syndrome. They are, are Down syndrome child free in Iceland because of widespread testing and abortion. Think of the message that sends. I grew up as a child with people with Down syndrome around me. Uh, nobody is perfect. It's just degrees. And even our level of utility doesn't matter. We're all equal. And I want to see this cultural change um, in America as well. We're a long way from truly, truly valuing every single person as being equal and, and do the same equality and fundamental dignity. And that's what I hope to see in 30 years from now. We look back and we see that we have solved the problem of disability by changing our cultural mindset and accepting everybody. Well, uh, I don't know if any, if, if I could say it better myself, Roger, but I couldn't agree with you more. Um, it's gonna, it continues to be uh, how we think about disability as a natural part of the human experience. Um, I know that's been my own personal journey and uh, I look forward to it uh, becoming further and further embedded. And finally, no, Admiral Wiaki, um, where do you think we're going to be in 30 years uh, when, when we're all back uh, on this panel uh, uh, talking about our progress? Yeah, thank you, Julie. Well, for, for the Indian Health Service as a direct uh, system of care or healthcare provider, as we consider where we want to be in the future, our goal is to break down barriers to care for all of our patients, regardless of ability. And this includes uh, leveraging technology and innovative care delivery models to bring health care to our patients rather than bringing patients in for health care. Uh, I, I think the current COVID pandemic has really sparked a huge leap forward in implementing some advancements that would likely eventually happen, but at a slower pace. Uh, the pace of technological advancement and innovation creates the possibility of things that we haven't even considered yet. And I'm really excited about what the future holds for delivering health care to all of our patients in, in innovative ways. So look forward to what 30 years from now will bring to uh, individual focused uh, health care delivery. Well, thank you, Admiral. And I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, not just for joining us today for this important conversation and this, really, this, this milestone achievement. And I want to thank them for everything that they do every day on behalf of Americans with disabilities. And uh, before we toss it over to my boss, um, the man I get to work alongside every single day, um, I just want to thank you on behalf of all Americans with disabilities. Um, and as a person with a disability myself, you know, uh, when we, we started just before we had technical difficulties, I had been saying that 
you know, as someone who really grew up in uh, after the ADA and the IDEA and the Rehab Act, um, I've rarely ever had to think twice about pursuing uh, all of my goals. Uh, it just never, ever occurred to me uh, that I would ever be stopped or, or face barriers uh, when I was going to school or looking and applying to jobs or just trying to hang out with my friends and my family. And, you know, in this role and across my adulthood, I've realized just how monumental the ADA signing was. Those things that I took for granted, as most children do, they were not available to generations of people with disabilities before me. And these rights, these opportunities have been available to me because those early generations fought so hard to ensure that they would be. As an adult, I recognize the debt my generation owes to those early advocates and fighters. I know we have some of them watching us today. And so I wanna share my heartfelt thank you. I am grateful beyond what words will ever capture for everything that you did for Americans with disabilities. It is my pleasure to sign back over to Lance Robertson for a close. All right, thank you, Julie. So well stated. Uh, I thought that was, again, just a heartfelt way to kind of wrap it up. And I want to echo, obviously, my thanks to all of the fellow panelists, some great, great peers that are key leaders in this administration and within HHS. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Calder. And of course, thank you, Roger. Uh, it's just an honor to work with you guys. And again, appreciate your work each and every day. And I think for our viewers, it's um, probably going to be nice for them to know that uh, we're actually launching within HHS a disability collaborative so that we make sure that these conversations um, continue to happen with some regular cadence. And uh, really, we're inviting all operating divisions and staff divisions across the agency to join us in that effort. So looking forward to the outcome of that. And then certainly, as Julie said, thanks so much to all the disability advocates and the networks who really have made all this possible. And uh, again, I know their work continues, but uh, we are here today because of their commitment and um, again, the resiliency in um, addressing what they knew were serious concerns in our country some decades back. So um, as we formally close, I've got just a few things to share here. Um, starting off with the ADA, as we know, is the culmination of many years of determined effort by people with disabilities and other disability advocates. And it uh, came to life with the support of many in Congress and uh, certainly across the Bush administration. It prohibits discrimination by local and state governments, provides standards for privately owned businesses and commercial facilities, protects against discrimination in the workplace and ensures equal access to healthcare, social services, transportation and telecommunications. Since its enactment, our country has taken uh, great strides toward the ADA's promise of true inclusion and Americans with and without disabilities increasingly live, learn, work, play, and contribute side by side. With the national expectation of accessibility and full participation clearly established in the ADA, the experiences of people with disabilities have reshaped our country uh, spurring more inclusive design and impressive technological advances. And that helps all of us. At ACL, we are thrilled to join the nation in celebrating this important milestone. But as we celebrate, we also know that we still have work to do. As Julie said earlier, the spirit of the ADA is at the core of our work at ACL. It is uh, threaded through almost literally everything that we do. Everyone, regardless of age or disability, as we would agree, should have the same opportunity to live and fully participate in the community and in making that possible for more people is obviously the reason that all of us get out of bed every day. That fundamental right does not change during a crisis. In fact, the increased COVID-19 risks faced by people with disabilities and older adults who live in nursing homes and other institutions make upholding that right and ensuring necessary and appropriate support in the community even more critical. As Calder talked about, it's more important than ever that we find ways to accelerate the work we are doing across the department toward that end. And as you heard here today, each agency is working within its individual area of responsibility 
to ensure equal access to health care and to human services, which is the other H in the Department of Health and Human Services, and to equip and support people with disabilities and their families, and to empower them to live the lives they want to live fully included in the community. And I hope you also got a sense of all the work that we're doing across the department as well to collaborate and build upon each other's work. Most of all, I hope that you came through. I hope that what came through to you is our commitment to achieving the equal opportunities and true inclusion that are the promise of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So again, we're very grateful for your time. We're grateful that you tuned in for this celebration. Again, thanks to the panelists. Julie, great job emceeing. You rock. And uh, thanks so much to all the disability advocates and those that have really made all of this possible. So on behalf of the Department of Health and Human Services, and as Secretary Azar said, very, very grateful to have spent some time today with you recognizing the achievements of the ADA. So with that, that concludes our event. Thank you. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at taxpayer expense.